Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we're going to talk to you about predictive maintenance in the industrial IoT sector. Uh, with me today is going to be Rob Russell, the CTO and co-founder of Sensei. They are an AI-based industrial analytics company. Really good conversation, and you'll get a lot of value out of. If you're watching this, um, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell icon so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're out. But other than that, on to the episode. Welcome, Rob, to the IT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Yeah, good to have you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm glad you're here. It's going to be good. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, let's kick it off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself and the company for our audience. Yeah, hi. So uh, I'm Rob Russell. I'm the chief technical officer at a company called Sensei. Um, and at Sensei, we've developed a cloud based predictive maintenance solution. Um, that is focused in the, from the manufacturing sector primarily. Uh, you know, my personal background was within aerospace and defense, mm. working on condition monitoring and taking that to scale. Uh, and we recognized back in 20, uh, 2014, 15, that there was an opportunity for us to bring this more into the industrial and manufacturing space. Um, and uh, that's the sort of vision that we've been following since then. When it comes to the use cases you all focus on, I know you mentioned kind of predictive maintenance, but can you talk us through just high level um, to bring a little bit more full circle for the audience? What what like some actual real life use cases that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah, so if if you think of um, you know the the foundation of what we do is actually building on top of condition monitoring, which is something that's been around for decades. People using information from machines to drive um, maintenance strategies, decide when to intervene. <clears throat> but what we've developed is a technology that enables that to be done at a much larger scale. So when you think about um, digitized factories, maybe where you've got thousands of machines connected that you've got the opportunity now to be monitoring that data at a large scale, it's not humanly possible. So mm. what um, sort of and digitization and industrial IoT brings is um, data um, growth that it's, it does, doesn't scale with, with humans. So you have to use technology to do that. Um, and that's what we do. So we build on top of those data sources, we perform automated analytics, and then the focus is to get information back to the maintenance team to enable better decision making so they can get mm. attention to the right machine at the right time, um, the, the, the sort of, some of the other benefits that this provides is changing maintenance strategies. You know, there's a sure. lot of organizations out there that can be very reactive or have a lot of planned maintenance. If you start to become much more data driven, you can move much right. more to condition based maintenance. Fantastic. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, when we're talking about the industrial and the manufacturing kind of space, what does the, mm -hmm. the current landscape look like when it comes to adoption with from from IoT technologies and so forth? Like where, beside, I mean, predictive maintenance obviously is a big area, but just generally speaking, where are we now? Kind of where have we kind of come from and where do you kind of see this going? Yeah, so if I, if I think back to when we started our journey in, in Sensei back in 2015, um, there was huge reluctance to cloud, for example. Um, there was companies mostly just exploring and talking about their sort of um, industrial IoT strategy. I don't think anybody called it digitization back then. Sure. Um, and then there was a lot of focus on industry four. Um, what we're starting to see now, though, is much more of a, a pull for the market to build on top of that sort of IoT infrastructure and platforms that they've invested in. Uh, so we see a lot of organizations out there that may, maybe we talked to, you know, three, four years ago um, and explained our technology and they said, Rob, we're not ready. Um, to me, I translated that as a brush off, right, uh, from, a, from a sales sort of process. But it was true. They weren't ready. Um, and now we're starting to see we're engaging with them. They've got the connectivity in place in their factories. Um, and now they're leveraging um, the various use cases where predictive maintenance is one, uh, along with you know all sorts of other sort of benefits you get from uh, connecting up your data. Absolutely. Um, so so I, I know we've kind of gone through here high level predictive maintenance, but if what what is the real I guess need in the space right now for it? Like you talked about, kind of being able to change their 
maintenance schedule and, and how they do things. And just talk a little bit more about the benefit there and kind of why that really is a big deal for this industry. Yeah. So, so there's more and more pressures being put on, uh, you know, manufacturing organizations, which end up finding their way down into <clears throat> operations and production. Um, you know, there's a, there's a range of benefits that you can result from a predictive maintenance approach where, you know, the, the most obvious one are is, uh, stopping those surprises uh, where machines break unexpectedly um, and then you can therefore avoid downtime. So this works in areas like um, automotive where you need high levels of uptime in your production mm -hmm. processes. But we find there's other um, types of manufacturing where maybe that's not quite so critical um, to have those various stops. So there the benefits come in, in other ways. You know, it's uh, reducing your maintenance burden, um, potentially even having better planning for the provision of new spare parts. Um, you know, some interesting sort of facts and figures that we've sort of picked up through various projects relate to the carbon footprint in spare parts um, can be substantially higher when you have to get those parts under an emergency work order, for example. Um, if you've got a proper planning of, uh, of your spare parts, you're not having to have things flown in under emergencies. Um, that carbon footprint's reduced and, and everybody's talking about sustainability today. So having that sort of impact and, and maybe a, a less than obvious way into sustainability mm. targets, uh, sure. we're finding quite interesting with customers. Yeah, it's been really interesting to kind of just follow along and see how the adoption of IoT and these you know, digital transformation initiatives are really benefiting industrial manufacturing um, spaces because like you said it's helping with sustainability it's helping improve efficiency um and i think overall it seems like it's really helping drive better business outcomes for these organizations and i'm those who are not you know kind of adopting as as much as the others are i, I imagine that there has to be some kind of lag for them to be able to keep up. Is there any kind of experiences you've come across where seeing companies adopt versus their competitors who maybe have not adopted IoT and what that's done for their business? Yeah, um, <clears throat> but what we see in some organizations, actually, it's not necessarily the most obvious like competitors in a different company. It's once we start mm -hmm. working with one factory in an organization, word gets out, and then you start to get that pull from other geographies. Um, because a lot of these, um, you know, we're in a globalized world now. It's not necessarily that the manufacturing has to take place in a specific area. Um, if one factory is more efficient than another, you get that internal competition going on as well. So that's been an interesting thing for us to realize and understand that right. <clears throat> once you have that example use case in, in one sector, you start to get the pull. Um, but yeah, we do see quite a, a range across possibly different types of sectors. So if we think of things that we class as more heavy industry, like yeah. pulp and paper, steel, aluminium, traditionally they've had a lot of reliability engineering capability there for decades, as opposed yeah. to maybe more food and beverage organizations. Um, and it's some, some that are coming later to it, but they're coming with technology or, or moving maybe a little bit faster and they're going through that cultural change um but but yeah it can it can be it, there's there's no one sector or one industry i would say that's really okay. leading the way here and, and when it comes to these companies that are maybe not adopting what what is it that's kind of causing the hesitation you know what are the challenges that you're really seeing in the space when it comes to getting a company potentially over the hump to bring this this um, technology into their business to give them access to the right types of data? Like, is there hesitations that they're not sure what exactly they need to be looking for? Is it, you know, um, just general hesitations because this is the way they've done things for so long? Like, what is it that, that kind of holds any of these companies up from kind of taking the leap and bringing in these IoT technologies and solutions into their business? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the cases, it can be related to things like security concerns and, and, and data um, ownership and data concerns. Um, but what we try and um, educate the customers about is the, the the information that you are maybe sending to a cloud application like Sensei, how to, you know, 
create that in such a way that it's not, you're not exposing the IP uh, and it's definitely you know getting the the security levels set up in the right way. Um, other aspects probably related to um, adoption it's, it's sometimes having that longer term vision. There's there's a lot of um, small science projects going on as I describe them and, and a lot of different customers that we see but these will end up being run in smaller use cases by innovation teams that are much more focused on demonstrating and proving technology as opposed to proving that the technology can actually be used in the business and okay. that's a really important point for us when we go in talking with clients we tend not to like to use language like proof of concepts or pilots we want to just sure. talk about an initial deployment because we want to get the technology down onto the shop floor and try and get it used and show to the, com the, the end customer that that technology can be used in their organization we feel a lot of these technologies are already proven now it's about adoption uh, and cultural and organizational change Gotcha. Fantastic. Uh, let me ask you, just kind of moving outside of that for a bit, what what, what other what are some of the biggest challenges you've seen this space just face in general? Um, uh, you know, as it relates to to IoT and and you know, just I guess across the board, there are other things not necessarily just related to predictive maintenance and and industrial manufacturing, but just from your all's vantage point, where do you see when it comes to digital transformation and IoT and so forth that we're seeing that there's you know still challenges that need to be overcome. Yeah, I, th I think it's just the nature of it just being a, a new, young, sort of nascent market um, that there, there's there's a bit of there can be confusion there about the various different options and protocols and things that can be used. Um, things are becoming much more plug and play, but there's still areas where I say in the industrial space, you need a bit more experience um, and expertise to implement some of these things, and in a lot of cases, there's um, a lot of organizations maybe with a bit more marketing hype that um, ends up resulting in levels of disappointment um, and then that can put people off um, you know right. we, we like to remain very open and transparent in what we are doing um, and, and, um, and, and focus in you know trying to un really understand the customer's problem as well um, in the initial stages yeah, that's um, that's a really good point. I think a lot of companies aren't necessarily thinking about it from the customer's perspective or that end user backwards and trying to really understand what is it exactly that we need to be solving. Um, I also have noticed that there's a lot of companies now transitioning to focusing a lot of their effort on the marketing and then their kind of sales side of pushing actual solutions as opposed to leading with with technology. Um, have you noticed any kind of similar change from from your all side of things? Just because I, I feel like a lot of times we've had companies that lead with technology, lead with hardware, and but at the end of the day, a lot of these companies, especially in the industrial space, they just want to know if that's what's being adopted is going to solve their problem and they can get back to doing their thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's there's a whole balance here. You know, <clears throat> obviously, I introduced myself as a the chief technical officer. Um, you know, I've got. Um, discussions that go on with my VP marketing, you know, and uh, there's, there's a balance to be found about um, how much, you know, information about the tech you sort of lead with as opposed to the, the business value and the solutions, yep. because, um, you, you know, it, it's very important to keep those benefits up front and the solution that you're providing. Think of it much more from a solution perspective. Um, but then also being able to give access to that information about the tech so people can make those decisions about how it's going to work and how it's going to fit for them. Um, right. Well, we've always kept a very open and agnostic approach. We don't, I mean, we're, we're a cloud software only organization. Right. We don't lock people into specific hardware solutions and right, try right. to remain agnostic as possible. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good approach. I mean, I think a lot of companies are trying to be more agnostic when it comes to any of the elements of IoT that they're touching, whether it's the hardware, the connectivity, you name it. They're trying to be more agnostic to make in order to build a solution or bring in their offering that is, is as, as, as ideal of a fit as possible, as opposed to um, forcing people one way when it may not be the best, you know, from an ROI standpoint. So um Totally, totally get that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, where do you like? Tell me about what do you think going into you know the rest of this year, twenty twenty three. Where does um, 
you know, what are you most looking forward to seeing kind of in the manufacturing space when it comes to IoT adoption and predictive maintenance and so forth? Anything that we should be able to look out for? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's just the, um, you know, what, what we're seeing is this rising trend in um, connected devices out of the box, uh, you yeah. know, and rather than having to retrofit a lot of sensing, which is great for us, um, and more, you know, pulling together and standardization and a lot of protocols. Um, you know, <clears throat> full disclosure, uh, you know, we, we're Sensei is, is now a Siemens business. So some of those hardware challenges we can see they're starting to yeah. be filled in there. But what it's doing is it's opening our eyes up much more to the technologies on the shop floor and appreciating that, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the, the level of connectivity by default in some of these more modern, you know, devices, whether it's motors, drives, conveyors, right. is, is quite fascinating, really. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, these retrofitting of, uh, of sensing capabilities will probably start to become less of an issue going forward, I hope. Definitely. And I think, the, you know, how you're able to bring in a solution that works well with legacy systems that are in place and been in place for many years is a very big deal. So, um, yeah, it's a very exciting space to kind of follow for for sure. And and again, thank you for taking the time to kind of educate our audience on some of these topics. How can our audience learn more, kind of follow up? They have questions, or just engage kind of further. Yeah. So if you reach out, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can if you if you want to contact any of our team, just it's hello at sensei.io. Um, okay. But I'm more than happy for uh, for people to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, Rob, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Excited to get this out for our audience, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks very much. Take care. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.